12-hour food, si 12 food system panel number one of today's uh, event. Thank you everybody for, for joining um, on this panel, which is related to the impact of COVID-19 um, pandemic on the food systems. Uh, we have uh, four presenters today, and we're gonna start with Dr. Chetty Robinson. And Chetty, uh, Dr. Robinson is an assistant professor in the Department of Agriculture Economics and Agricultural Business at New Mexico State University. She earned her PhD at New Mexico State University in the College of Business. Her research interests aim to improve agricultural producers' incomes by providing a better understanding of consumer behavior, market research, and general business research. She's an active member of the National Agri-Marketing Association, uh, short a uh, NAMA, Western Agricultural Economics, Economics Association, and International Food and Agricultural Marketing Association. I also very glad to say that um, I cooperate very closely with Dr. Robinson and with the Department of, Femin uh, of uh, Food uh, in the Group of Food Science and Technology. So I'm really happy to hear uh, Dr. Robinson's presentation. Go ahead, Shelly. Thank you, Ethan. Um, and I would like to thank you, everybody, for joining us today and for the invitation to talk about this research. So um, let me get start the screen share real quick and we'll get started. Um, except it's not here. One moment, please. Hmm. Okay, hold on. That's interesting. One moment, please. Let me do. Okay. How's that look? Can you can you see it properly? I'm hoping. No, no. We we still see your uh, your face. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> We're glad to see that, but. <laughs> That's not what we need. Okay. Let me try one more time. Uh, this is one. Fabulous. Don't you love it? I Are you hitting the share screen button. button? Yeah. No, it's not showing up my options. My slides. Okay, hold on. Let me close back out and try it again. This one is open. Yes. Okay. Okay, share. Okay, here we go. Now, can you see it properly? Now we can see it. Yes, Fabulous. now it's perfect. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Sorry for the delay. Um, this project all um, came about, of course, in the middle of COVID in, in a state like New Mexico, where we have lots of rural communities. Um, access to quality food became a serious issue. And of course, um, after the end of this, you'll, you'll understand kind of where the scenario all plays out and, and why it continues to be a problem. So this research was done um, through a project with the New Mexico Department of Agriculture and Georgie Calderon Ellis, who is a graduate research assistant also helped pull this all together. So if you look closely at the table, you'll see the, you know, the U.S.'s total red meat production um, has been on a relatively steady incline. However, you see the blue line, um, that is New Mexico's um, red meat production, and you can see that it's pretty, it's pretty steadily on a decline, which is interesting considering that in our state, um, you'll see that we still have a lot of animals here. We're not necessarily following with the trends that's happening in the in the U.S., but we're we still are a significant um, cow calf operation um, with 56 percent of all the livestock in New Mexico being a cow calf, valued about 1.5 billion dollars. Um, many of those animals, of course, meat animals, um, account for 993 million dollars, which is about 31 percent of our um, commodity cash receipts. So we're a small player, but yet in the U.S., but in this rural state, we are 
still um, we still have a lot of animals and a lot of opportunity to um, produce a high quality product for our citizens and contribute to the overall U.S.'s um, meat supply. So in the whole COVID world, when you think about animal proteins, specifically for New Mexico, the majority of course are um, cow-calf operations. You have to consider what happened in the middle of COVID. This is a, a one day or one week snapshot of the meat processing plants um, in June of 2020 and what was closed or had limited operations or that were in a stage of reopening that had been closed but were trying to gear back up. This continued of course um, all over the United States, all through 2020 with limited um, capacity, um, issues, severe issues with labor availability. Um, clearly, the supply chain, we had the animals, we were growing the animals in the U.S., we just didn't have a place to take them to meet the demand for um, the consumers. And of course, we've all seen the photos of the empty shelves, we've all probably experienced some of this. And so um, with this in mind, in New Mexico, um, a year ago, the New Mexico legislature came to the New Mexico Department of Agriculture and asked if they would um, assess the potential for a mobile slaughter unit. So uh, many legislators were, it's kind of funny what they considered a mobile slaughter unit. They thought that a mobile slaughter unit would truly just roll up to the pro or to the ranch, be able to harvest, pack, wrap the animal as a whole. Um, the actual legislator that wrote the, the um, House Memorial Bill that funded this project, that was their understanding of what a mobile slaughter unit actually functions as. Unfortunately, it is not an accurate description of what they really truly do. So for the point of this whole conversation, you have to understand that a mobile slaughter unit truly harvests the animal. They, they do nothing more than get the, um, take the animal, um, process it where it is a full carcass um, and starts cooling. That is truly the gist. In this photo, you can see it's a standard um, pickup pulling this trailer. This is an operating slaughter, mobile slaughter unit. If you look closely at the top, it has a hook, um, that a hoist in a sense, that is able to help hoist the animal once it has been um, um, bolted is what they refer to it. When they bolt the animal, then um, they hoist it so that they're able to start the process. It's a very simple piece of equipment. That trailer, it's very small, as you can see. Um, it is not extensive in any sense of the word um, as far as its capabilities of fully processing an animal. Um, the abilities of an actual processing unit, of course, the main function is just truly to travel to the site of the animal, where the animal is, and bring in the carcass back to the actual processing. They knock and bleed the animal, they remove the offal, they split the carcass if that is what the um, animal owner wants where they split it into two. They hang it, which helps in the cooling process, and then they transport it. Truly that's the limitations of this, the function of a mobile slaughter unit. Um, and we, ha we have to talk the, about the limitations because so many have a misconception of what a mobile slaughter unit can do. They cannot, cannot um, carry out the full process of processing an animal. They only harvest, essentially do the, the, the kill of it. Um, the picture there on, on your left, when you're looking at it, that is inside of that trailer. In the far back is the cooling room. Um, it is not a freezer, it is truly just a cooling room that allows the carcass to naturally cool down um, en route to the processing plant. But as you can see on the top is the hook that from that hoist, it moves that carcass through most of the carcasses. A normal steer in New Mexico, a fattened steer should weigh about 800 pounds after it's been skinned and the offal has been removed. 
So it's pretty substantial piece of, or substantial weight mass. And so you have to have that hoist and the hanging hook system. Um, but it is relatively a simple piece of equipment. There's sinks, washing, um, containers to contain all the awful and fluids um, that have to be disposed of properly. But it's a very simple piece of equipment. So to, to meet the, um, the request of our New Mexico legislators that were interested in funding such a project, it was really necessary for us to um, talk to mobile slaughter unit operators within the United States. So our first step was to kind of assess what it takes to actually operate it effectively. So initially we had 54 units or operations that we identified through Google search that um, were in operation at the time. By the time the IRB approval process was completed, we had lost nine of those MSUs that were no longer in business, um, reducing our sample size to 45. Of those 45, we were able to interview 10. Nine of them were currently operating as a mobile slaughter unit company. Um, and one had recently retired, but had years of experience being a mobile slaughter unit. So we included him into the overall interview samples. So just in general, I kind of summarize this with the timing um, being as limited um, for this discussion, but um, we broke the interviews down into a couple of different sections. And so the operations, the general operations questions, when you look here at the bullets, um, those operators, 67% of them travel less than 200 miles um, from and to the slaughter sites. 88% of them are processing multiple livestock species. So um, beef, pork, sheep, goats, many of them indicated they also processed um, wild game. So big hunting regions would also incorporate um, the hunting aspect to, into their marketing plan. Um, 55 operated with two employees, one of those two being the actual owner where the um, 45 of those actually were only a solo operation, which one person hoisting the 800 pound carcass is pretty impressive. It's a lot of work for one person. Um, they're, they're very dedicated, these individuals that are operating, but this is not an easy task and an easy, an easy way to make a living. Um, and again, the livestock that are coming in to be um, harvested, the animals actually have to walk on their own. This is part of the USDA's FIFAS requirements. And so many individuals think the mobile slaughter would be good if you had a cow break its leg or you know, some event like that happen where they're still alive, they're still healthy, but they, they need to be um, dealt with pretty quickly. Unfortunately, with the current policies um, through the USDA, if they are not able to walk on their own, and walk up to the trailer, then they are unable to be processed. So that's the operation details of the mobile slaughter. The marketing questions, we were kind of curious on how they're getting the word out. Um, we were actually pretty surprised that we only had, you know, 45, um, when you Google search mobile slaughter for different states, that was relatively a very small number for, for this technique that has been around since the late 1990s. Um, and so I was curious to kind of see how their marketing, how it works, what kind of tools they use. Um, as you can see, 89% of them use word of mouth as their primary promotion tool. Um, six out of nine of them utilize some kind of social media for their, you know, they tag their customers and they, you know, they're utilizing Facebook, Instagram. Um, only 33% of them had some kind of online presence. Um, some of them had, I think two of them only had websites, but truly it's a word of mouth game for this one. Um, and then when you go into the um, inspection, of course, when you're dealing with animal proteins, you have to consider the inspection services. For us to use a mobile slaughter um, unit or aspect within New Mexico, the, in, the mobile slaughter unit itself would have to either have a federal inspector um, that traveled with the mobile unit to actually witness and inspect the animal prior to harvest. 
um, which is a problem all in itself because that adds a whole nother element of cost to the operations. But within our interviews, you can see um, there were a couple that had 67% of them are operating under the custom exempt, which means that, that that meat cannot be used for resale. The meat goes back to the animal owner. So whoever owned it is the one that owns the meat. 22% um, of them are federally inspected. Those are the individuals that would be allowed to sell into restaurants, food service sectors, and grocery stores. And then the 11% were certified through a state meat inspection. In New Mexico, we currently do not have a state meat inspection program. Um, there's a lot of interest in reestablishing such a program, but as of now, we don't have one. So the only option for New Mexico's uh, meat processors and or um, cow-calf beef growers would be to um, incorporate a federally inspected ins um, individual into the, the mobile slaughter unit. So the key takeaways from the operators that are out there in the industry is they travel between 30 and 200 miles round trip. Um, many of them add additional services that also help when they're in the end of the day income, like they, they do knife sharpening or tanning hides, those additional services that help support the mobile slaughter unit's overall profitability. They all struggled with um, retaining employees. This is a hard job and you're dealing with harvesting animals and lots of physically demanding lifting work and cutting work that is really, it's a tough job. So employees are a huge aspect of the issues. And then of course the mobile slaughter, it is only a slaughtering facility, it's an added service. And so if you don't have a, a brick and mortar kind of processing plant to take the animal to, then we have not benefited our system at all. So we still have the limitation. And in New Mexico, that's a huge problem because our capacity, um, as of now, I believe we have eight federally inspected facilities. We have a, a bunch of little custom exempt guys, but none of them have capacity um, I think if you wanted to book a, uh, an appointment for an animal to get harvested, you're about six months out right now, which is a huge problem. So the interview takeaway, okay, so we kind of have an idea of what it'll take to run a mobile slaughter unit for New Mexico. But then we had to step back and say, okay, now what about the New Mexico livestock producers? Would they even be interested in providing or utilizing a service like this? So the second part of this project was to actually enter or survey New Mexico livestock producers. We were able to um, obtain emails um, for 14 or 18,106 brand owners in the state of New Mexico. Um, there was quite a few undeliverables, but, so we ended up with a spinal sample size of just a little over 14,000 um, emails that went out. By the way, that is confirmation. You can break Outlook if you try to send that out yourself. Two more minutes, Dr. Robinson, please. Pardon? Uh, two more minutes. Okay, I'm moving. Okay, so Neil said we ran through the livestock um, board. We um, surveyed 34 questions, a whole gamut of questions. Um, our response, 67% of them were beef, which makes sense for our state. It's very reflective of what you see within our agriculture sector. The interesting part of all of this is the dairy group is more likely to use a mobile slaughter facility or mobile um, slaughter service with a highest, the highest mean of all the groups and beef is least likely, which is where the majority of our, you know, U.S. consumers eat 55 pounds of red meat a year right now is the average 55 pounds and our producers are very unlikely to utilize such a service, which is no surprise kind of when you go and talk to them. Um, I'm gonna keep going. I think we'll just go to the overall key findings. So the interviews gave us the details to actually operate and the survey from the producers gave us some indications about their likeliness to utilize it. When you consider um, the producers, re re reluctancy to utilize such a service, and then the limitations of the actual processing facilities. 
um, again, we kind of get ourselves into a situation where there's no reason for a state to, to go into such an endeavor. And since this report, this research was completed, um, the state legislature has backed away from funding mobile slaughter units. Um, but to give you a little bit additional information, the mobile slaughter units have all the same environmental permits and inspection requirements that a processing facility has to deal with. They have water source requirements, they have sewage requirements. This is not an easy process and an easy solution to help get more steady local supply meat into our supply chain. Um, even the operators that run the mobile slaughter units, they have to have a CDL, even if it's um, a commercial or a small normal pickup, they still have to have the CDL because of the materials that they'll be hauling in that trailer. The offal would be considered a hazardous material if it was spilled on the interstate, if they were in a wreck or such. And so they require the operators to even have a CDL, which in many cases is pretty excessive. So on that, my last breath of air, do you have any questions? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Robinson. We'll have time uh, at the end for questions. So if anyone has questions, please post them on the, on the Q&A um, chat and we'll discuss those. Thank you very much and big applause for Dr. Robinson. So please stay tuned for the Q&A questions, Dr. Robinson. I will be here. Thank you. Our next presenter is uh, Dr. Franny Miller. Hi. I always like going after chatty because I tend to talk really fast. And so this way I can just blame it on that I'm trying to catch up. So okay. I will catch us back up to time because I talk entirely too fast. But my talk was on changes in the Mexican dairy industry. Okay, and before so you start, Franny, let me just introduce you, please. Don't, don't <laughs> go that fast. We do have a little bit of time for your introduction because Dr. Miller is a very important person here at New Mexico State University. She's assistant professor in the Department of Agriculture Economics and Agriculture of Business at NMSU, as well as Dr. Chetty. She is an NMSU al alum with a bachelor's in animal science and a master's degree in agricultural economics. Her PhD from University of Texas at Dallas in public policy and political economy. Go ahead, Dr. Miller. Okay. Um, okay, well, thank you. And thank you guys for your interest. Um, this was a great opportunity for me to look a little south of the border, which I find to be very interesting. So just kind of an overview of New Mexico's dairy industry and how it's evolved. You have two or really three main types of production. Um, the first is, is very similar to New Mexico, where they're taking advantage of the cool evenings and the arid climate, which is really good for cow health. And in those areas, you have pretty industrialized, what we think of as a modern dairy facility. Those are mainly Holstein cattle, and they are giving something very similar to our milk production. They're about 75 pound average. And then you go a little further down, especially in Jalisco, and you get the Holstein Zebu cross. Um, some of this is, has had an impact where you have people leaving and coming to the U.S. to work in, and sort of some family style uh, dairy farms with maybe one person operating for their three brothers or, or something like that. And then you go further south into the tropics and you have Zebu, um, which is really operated as a dual purpose breed where you have um, kind of lower production and they often shift between a focus on beef production if that's where the price is higher to milk production. So it's kind of in and out. Um, the actual production in the tropics has stayed constant, but the share of, of their production has dropped as um, You've seen the industrialization, especially in the 90s. Um, so there's been some changes that, Lo that Obrador tried to um, focus on. There was a lot of promise about how we were going to do guaranteed price programs. A lot of that has fallen off and producers have generally not felt like they, they did much to, to increase production from small and medium producers. It's kind of a, a little closer look. Um, the graph is from 2019, then we go up to 2020. Um, and then over to 2021. Um, here's kind of where we see, so Jalisco is as a state, the top producer, but this region, um, La Laguna region is the high, that's where most of the industrialization has happened. And so um, 
And one of the things that we've seen is that production is growing at 1.4%. Mexican population of one source was growing at about a little less than 1%. And so you're starting to get an increased production of, of milk output per capita. Um, kind of overview, Mexico is eighth in the world for milk production. They produce about 12 billion uh, metric tons of, of milk uh, dairy products per year. Um, the U.S. is at about 96.3%. India is the first at 154 billion. Um, so they blow everyone else away. But we're about the same as the entire EU. Um, so um, one kind of emphasis is that Mexico is our largest dairy export market, accounting for over 100 or 1.5 billion in U.S. dairy exports in 2019. The top exports are consistently milk power, milk powder and cheese. Um, here's a picture of some people producing, taking non-fat dry milk and mixing it with hot water in Queretaro and um, producing cheese that way. So really we see a lot of um, ingredients going into Mexico. And Mexico is the third largest food processor in the Americas um, behind the United States and Brazil. But this is an area of a lot of growth and dynamism in their economy. And so this is a um, kind of a focus for our, our dairy production. Um, you saw um, in 2020, we did see um, tourism dropping down a bunch for obvious reasons, but that's also a driver for food processing ingredients. So as tourism is starting to um, come back up, then we're also starting to see some of that additional import demand from Mexico. Um, Mexico traditionally sources around 90% of its food processing ingredients locally, but it's still a, a very important market for our U.S. food ingredients. Of all the graphs here, this is probably the most important to the issue of food trade. Here's the um, appreciation of the dollar relative to the peso throughout the, you know, dramatically through the pandemic, and then it has still stayed higher. That's one of the pressures on their um, dairy process or their dairy sector is because of the um, kind of less purchasing demand. It's also pushing up feed costs for production. Um, let's see, the other thing that I wanted to show, I think we pay too little attention to demographics. And one of the exciting things about Mexico as an importer of our products is that they have this super healthy demographic um, shape where they have a lot of young, a lot of young people with it, that, which tends to to sort of increase fluid consumption. Um, kind of just a, um, Mexico mainly imports from the US because they use a lot of ingredients. They kind of flirt with New Zealand who exports a lot of, of powders. Um, the main thing that, if you look at Mexico, what the main thing that they're importing is skim milk powder and non-fat dry milk powder, and then some cheeses. Um, Oh, let me think. Um, so China, or last year, 2020, or two years ago, um, Mexico surpassed Canada in terms of the importance of, as an import country, um, they are up 39% from last year in terms of imports. So this is really, Mexico is a big part of helping to drive our dairy sector's recovery. Um, and then um, you can see that the milk powder, all milk powders are 29.34% in 2021. So really starting to see the recovery from, from that standpoint. Um, let's see what else did I wanna say on that. Okay. So this is a little bit dated, this is um, 2017, but I kinda wanted just to show you how exports to Mexico has remained a, a substantial part of our total dairy exports. Um, and, and then when we look at the jump in 2021, as we started to recover from the COVID impacts, you can see that Mexico drove a lot of the, the increase. And like I said, the, the improvements that we're seeing in our own dairy sector, Mexico has played a large role in that. And while I'm on the topic of thanking Mexico, um, it is our largest dairy export market, accounting for 1.5 billion. But the other part of it is from the bottom of our heart, there has been a long time that the 
uh, Mexican population has been a really integral part of U.S. milk production. Um, right now in 2013, so this is little, again a little bit dated, but the share of milk produced on farms with immigrant workers is 79.1%. Um, it was interesting because I just got to take a group of students to uh, Wisconsin and um, in Wisconsin, which we think of as the dairy, you know, the main dairy part, 40% of the Wisconsin dairy farm workers are Mexican, 90% are undocumented. So it just kind of highlights, I just wanted to throw that in and say, um, the Mexican population has been a big part of our dairy industry for a long time. A little bit on consumption. Um, there's been a big push towards the ultra, ultra high treated, um, ultra high temperature milk because of its shelf stability. Um, so Mexico consumption is really focused around fluid milk with an increase in this um, ultra, high, ultra high temperature treatments. Um, the jump because of the pandemic that demand for that topic or for that type of uh, fluid milk increased quite a bit. Um, but so is the price and that they are facing the same kind of inflation. They're about 7%. And so they're facing the same food strains that we are. Um, another thing is that Mexican, uh, Mexican queso is, is increasing also. Um, industrial cheese making uses about 25% of the total milk that Mexico produces, but then about the same percentage is used by small scale and artisan producers. And there's kind of this increasing focus, especially as the country gets richer, an increasing focus on the artisanal, and that also goes with the, the increased tourism. Um, and that's my references. And, um, it, and so questions to the end, I'll turn over my share and thank you guys. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Miller, to help us recover some time. So we are, we're on time and we'll have time it's really not oh. Jenny's fault. I talked that fast. <laughs> <laughs> it was strategic. <laughs> no, thank you very much. Uh, and, uh, and remember, if you have questions, please post them on the Q&A chat, and we'll work on that towards at the end of the um, of this panel. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Karen Edge. Dr. Karen, Dr. Edge, please. And I'll introduce. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, first of all, I'm not a doctor. I am just an MPH. Um, but uh, let's see here. I am going to talk about um, foodborne outbreaks during the pandemic. If I can figure out how to share my screen. Okay. While uh, you share your screen, let me introduce Dr. A uh, MPH. <laughs> 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 uh, um, so Karen uh, got her MPH in International Health and Epidemiology at Tulane in 1988 and has been working mostly on infectious disease. Uh, she's done a surveillance, foodborne disease and pertussis surveillance and response. She's also worked for a while on sub substance use EP where she implemented a surveillance system for not fatal overdose and link them to services. So um, uh, go ahead, Karen. Thank you, Dr. Delgado. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you. I'm glad to be in here. I was having some technical issues earlier, so I'm glad those stopped. Um, can you see my screen? I can't quite tell. Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So we, this is um, just a epi curve of the enteric outbreaks we've had from 2020 to 2022. And this is January, 2020. Here's March, 2020, when we were first shut down for COVID. And you can see it shut down really worked on enteric pathogens too. We were not <clears throat> leaving our house for the most part. We were masking up, we were social distancing and we saw a huge drop in our number of enteric outbreaks. Most of these um, are often norovirus, which is very much spread person to person. So having that lack of contact for those months while we were all under lockdown really cut our number of, of uh, outbreaks that we had. Um, this is 2015, but this is showing enteric outbreaks by year. And this is including New Mexico in um, national outbreaks that happened. So you, oh, I just noticed my 
legend did not work right. This blue is person to person. Red is foodborne outbreaks where it was definitely tied to a food. Um, yellow is animal contact and that, that's primarily the chickens, uh, baby chicks at Easter time is a lot of this animal contact and um, just a handful of others. So we really have not had a whole lot of foodborne. In 2021, the, the foodborne that we did have, um, we were part of national outbreaks and I think there were four of them that we had people in the national outbreak. Only two of those outbreaks had a vehicle identified. One of them you may have heard was uh, Salmonella or Annienberg, and that was tied to, um, associated with both white and yellow. They weren't able to specify more specifically, but white and yellow onions from Mexico. And then another one of these, has not been definitely identified, but um, it really seems to be tied to uh, beef jerky, primarily coming from Mexico. The cases we've had in New Mexico, we interviewed and to a T, every one of them bought beef jerky while they were on the bridge waiting to come back into the state. So we couldn't even find a, there was no product to go and test. So we probably won't get a definitive answer on that one, but it's most likely the beef jerky from Mexico again. Um, this is the enteric outbreaks of just our New Mexico cases, 2020, 21, and 2022. Just uh, one foodborne, and that was, again, I believe that was um, salmonella back in 2020, but these are all person-to-person -person transmission. So we're really not seeing huge outbreaks of foodborne uh, transmission, which means our our chain is working, I think, for the most part, but um, we still do get a lot of foodborne pathogens uh, passed among people in other ways. County's outbreaks. Um, 2021, when we started opening back up, a lot of these were norovirus again, and we had outbreaks uh, kind of around the state, Bernalillo, Doniana, Grant, Santa Fe, and Taos counties. The main culprit is usually long-term care facilities, um, hospital rehab, retail. Uh, this one actually could have been, it started out, we were thinking this one was foodborne because it was tied to a taco truck, but as it turns out, it was uh, basically a party at, at Trader Joe's and it ended up being a retail setting. Um, I'll talk about this primarily homeless one. This is actually a Shigella outbreak rather than Noro and I'll go into a little bit more detail on that. Had just a handful, two, three, four, five, six or so, seven in 2022 so far. They've all been norovirus and they have all been associated with long-term care facilities. Just to talk about um, one of the ongoing outbreaks we've had in almost all of these cases, I think we've had three out-of-state cases associated with this, but these it's primarily New Mexico. This is a Shigella cluster, and Shigella is almost always thought of as a foodborne pathogen. However, it's transmitted really easily. It, it can take as little as 10 to 100 organisms to um, infect somebody, so it's got a really small infective dose. Another problem with Shigella is even after you feel better and your diarrhea has stopped, you can continue to shed the organism for up to a month afterwards. So that leads to some issues. As you can see here, because we had our initial cases recorded back in May of last year, and Shigella is a very common um, STD among men who have sex with men. So we we weren't surprised to get that reported. We This was a men who had sex with men, and then we had just a sporadic case. We couldn't really identify any risk factors. And then about a month later, we had two more men who had sex with men. And so right after that, we had a case. This orange is the homeless population that we, we know these people are homeless. So as it turns out, doing a little more digging, these original three gentlemen who were reported as men who had sex with men are also homeless. And so that was sort of an introduction into the homeless population. Then we had a little break and then a couple more sporadic. And then these two green cases, we basically we determined it's a cluster based on whole genome sequencing at our state lab. And so we were really surprised to get these two associated with our cluster because these were two samples from gorillas at the zoo. And um, that sort of opened our eyes. It's like, what is going on here? Now th they're matching with homeless people, with men who have sex with men, with sporadic cases. And now we have two gorillas that match. What, what is up? So we went to the zoo and this ended up being, um, these were the only two that we had sequenced that matched our cluster, but it ended up really cutting a really wide swath through the primates at the zoo um, last summer. They ended up losing one of the gorillas. They ended up losing siamangs. Um, we went to the zoo and went over PPE, donning and doffing, because 
our sort of hypothesis at the time was there had been a large homeless camp outside the zoo and it seems like people were going into the zoo um, like at nighttime or somebody had tracked through it, brought it into the primate houses where it then spread from the gorillas to the siamangs to the chimpanzees who are all housed in different buildings. So obviously um, uh, infection control was not high on the list at at the zoo. So when we found these cases, we went in and talked about um, PPE for them and trying to cut back what we were tracking through to all the primate houses, and then went back and started re-interviewing some of our cases to see if they if there was any overlap with the produce that they feed the, the primates at the zoo. There was some overlap, but nothing really pinpointed. And then we uh, continued getting sporadic cases, but then it really shifted at the, whoops, at the end of, uh, at the, you know, the, into the homeless population. And so this was at the end of the year and all the orange bars were homeless cases. And these were obviously only people that went in to get tested at the hospital, stayed in the emergency room long enough during COVID to get seen, get tested, get the whole genome sequence. So we know there were a lot more people out there with this. We ended up working with homeless camps uh, homeless advocates in city of Albuquerque. This is all Bernalillo County, by the way, I forgot to mention that. Um, homeless advocates and got additional hand washing um, units set up in the homeless camps, additional portalettes, and got the word out to homeless advocates that this was ongoing because these were people that had no facilities for keeping clean. They weren't able to wash their hands. So we were working with them really strongly and the street outreach people. So We've seen a tapering off, but I've just had uh, three cases reported at the end of March. So I keep thinking this one is about done, but it, it's ongoing. So just to point out that this is a foodborne pathogen. We think of it as a foodborne pathogen, but we've had this long outbreak going on where probably it is not primarily foodborne at all. So just to show you um, all the ins and outs that go on in some of these outbreaks. But this has been our largest one. The others that we've had, like I said, have been norovirus for the most part. We have not had a big foodborne outbreak in New Mexico in the past couple of years. And that's all I have. So I'll save questions for later and I will stop sharing, I think, yes. Thank you very much, Karen. A big applause for your presentation as well. Uh, <laughs> our next presenter is uh, Jack Dean. And Jack, he's um, uh, um, is a master student in the Center for Latin American Studies at the University of Arizona. He's joining us to, uh, today, and he holds a, BA, uh, a bachelor's in astrobiology and bio, biogeosciences, and a bachelor in, in anthropology from Arizona State University. He conducts research around two scholastic foci political eco ecology, informed anthropology of marine resources in Mexico, and historiographical approaches to gender equi equity in North America soccer. Currently, he's a uh, CLA IMAS Environment Society Fellow, as well as the book reviewers editor for the Journal of Political Ecology. He's also a freelance journalist with publication in outlets, including a1 Universal and Slate magazines. Thank you very much, Jake, for being here today and presented at this symposium. Go ahead. Um, thank you. <clears throat> can you see my slides okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jake Dean. And uh, as Dr. Delgado just said, I primarily work uh, looking at the anthropology of conservation, ecotourism, and marine resources in Mexico. And today I want to talk to you specifically about small scale fisheries in Mexico and how a US ban on wild caught Mexican shrimp has added some significant complexities to the response to COVID-19 within the country. And so specifically, um, I'll be talking first a little brief overview about the economics of fisheries in Mexico, as well as the status of COVID-19 and how that has impacted these fisheries before moving to a case study about the upper Gulf of California to try and quantify and uh, put a little um, case study of the impacts of this ban on shrimp imports before returning to a conclusion to talk about new ways to approach conservation uh, through the socio-ecological community. So it's first important to understand that small-scale fisheries are a really critical part of the Mexican economy. Uh, government statistics in 2018 
found that over 250,000 small scale fishers were operating in Mexico with thousands of small rural isolated communities relying on fishing as their primary industry. And a lot of these remote coastal communities have less access to social and economic infrastructure, which makes these small scale fisheries even more important. But also it's important to understand that there's a significant gendered aspect to the as or to accessing small scale fisheries in Mexico. Uh, in fact, the majority of fishers themselves are men. However, there are higher rates of female participation in indirect jobs, uh, which we'll talk about here in a second. Um, because it's important to understand that these fisheries and fishing operations don't just provide jobs and economic resources to fishers themselves, but also for individuals working in processing, transportation, you know, building boats and creating fishing supplies, as well as conservation and monitoring of these fish populations. So these are large communal operations that provide a lot of socioeconomic opportunities. However, there were significant problems already in small scale fishing industry before the pandemic. First, the fact that there's a significant information gap, uh, both in environmental data about the fisheries themselves, as well as socioeconomic data covering individuals within this space, especially because government and public policy analysis tend to ignore a lot of the local knowledge of the fishing industry provided by locals in these communities but also that statistics on catch and production rates fail to include the actual participation of women in fisheries, especially in a number of jobs like monitoring, uh, surveilling the fishery, as well as labor within the family. Uh, second, as I've already touched on a little bit, there's significant gender discrimination in access to fisheries. Not only um, are fishing cooperatives, which are the main way that a lot of these small scale uh, fisheries are organized, um, membership tends to be passed on patrilinearly. So that means that, you know, if a father dies or is going to retire from the cooperative, that that membership in the cooperative is then going to go to his son or a male relative. And furthermore, if women are trying to join these cooperatives, new members must accrue experience in the actual extraction of fish from fisheries. However, given their lack of existing access, it's really hard to accrue that experience and gain membership within these cooperatives. But furthermore, there's also a lack of access to basic human rights in a lot of these rural coastal communities, which includes things from education, healthcare infrastructure, which is obviously critical in the midst of a pandemic, as well as water and electricity. But furthermore, we also see that aquaculture is taking over an increasing share of seafood production, especially given concerns about the environmental sustainability of wild caught fish. And uh, UN and international statistics actually predict that over the next couple decades, aquaculture will go from representing roughly 12% of the Mexican market to over a 40% market share, as well as concerns over overfishing of specific fisheries. Um, and COVID-19 has complicated the issue of I apologize for my dog. Um, so COVID-19 has complicated a lot of the responses. Um, so first off, uh, there are significant issues in policy responses. First, uh, with the delayed implementation of social distancing in March of 2020, as well as a phased reopening um, that allowed a lot of the disease spread to continue. Um, and this contributed to extreme mortality rates in Mexico. Um, an analysis in 2020, which I'm using excess mortality rates specifically because of low testing and delayed reporting of COVID-19 cases, um, but an excess mortality analysis shows us that roughly about 26 people per 10,000 were excess mortalities during this uh, section of the pandemic, which leads to over 300,000 excess deaths, um, which is obviously a pretty significant number in just one year. And part of the reason for this is the prevalence of chronic non-degenerative diseases within Mexico um, and high rates of things like obesity, diabetes, and hypertension, creating coexisting conditions with COVID-19 and increasing the mortality of the virus. Um, and so initial estimates in the first few months of the pandemic in 2020 by academics found roughly a 9.2% death rate for those testing positive for COVID-19. So this was clearly a significant public health care crisis. And even when looking at official statistics from the World Health Organization, we can see that there's millions of confirmed cases and hundreds of thousands of confirmed deaths directly related to COVID-19. And this has increased a number of pressures on small scale fisheries within the country. First, I think is the most obvious and as a couple other speakers have already talked on this panel, there were significant supply chain disruptions. Uh, first, because there's you know, obviously issues with transport, but also market closures internationally and difficulties getting your product to those international markets, as well as worker absences that significantly impacted small scale fishing operations. You know, you can think if you're in a really small scale fishing operation and you have 
one of your fishers who can't go out that day, that's a pretty significant loss. But second, gender inequity within small scale fisheries got even worse, uh, specifically because federal fishery subsidies from the Mexican government to those impacted by the pandemic went overwhelmingly to male run businesses. And this is partially why the discrepancy in the reporting of female labor within fisheries is so significant. But furthermore, this compounded the already disparate access to healthcare, which again is very important within the pandemic. But third, it increased the need for fishermen to rely on technology, not only to operate their boats and fishing operations, but also to um, improve their communication to get their product out. Um, and so this required not only need for new technology, but need for network infrastructure and electrification. And therefore the costs of entry here and differential access to that infrastructure created significant disparities amongst fishermen about who was able to best adapt to the changes during the pandemic. But fourth and finally, we also saw significant pricing changes, especially for high value fishery products in international markets. And these price drops significantly decreased the ability of small scale fishers within Mexico to gain economic benefit from their products. And therefore, to kind of contextualize this, I wanna zoom in on a specific fishery and explore how a shrimp import ban from the United States amidst the COVID pandemic has created significant issues for a community. And so specifically, I wanna to turn to the upper Gulf of California, which is located in between Baja California Norte and Sonora, uh, pretty close to where I live here in Tucson. And you can see kind of a close up map here. And this fishery is pretty significant uh, given the high value of blue shrimp um, which represent a majority of local landings within the market, although there are a number of other fisheries. And these fisheries are really central, not only to the social fabric and social life of these communities, but because they're the main source of income for these coastal communities in the region. And to put a little bit of numbers behind it, uh, it's estimated that at the turn of the century, there were 50,000 small scale vessels in the entire Gulf as well as um, when we look at just a single year for the upper Gulf of California, um, just in the town and community of San Felipe, this industry represented over 263.3 million pesos and within Santa Clara over 640 million pesos. So this is a multi-million dollar industry that is critical for these communities and also performs a significant role in social life. However, uh, leading up to the pandemic and within the pandemic context, the United States government put significant import bans on wild caught shrimp, uh, which is really problematic because the United States is one of the largest markets for these small scale fisheries. So in 2018, um, the United States government put a court order to ban all Mexican imports from within the Northern Gulf of California, uh, specifically to protect the Vaquita Marina, which I'll get to a bit later. But also in the midst of the pandemic in April, 2021, the US State Department announced an expansion of these export or ban on exports of Mexican wild shrimp uh, from the entire country due to concerns over their conservation practices in relation to sea turtles. So you might be wondering why we're going to completely blanket ban um, wild caught shrimp from Mexico. And that's partially because of two critical pieces of legislation. One, the Marine Mammal Protection Act and two, the Endangered Species Act. And both of these pieces of legislation have stipulations upon the federal government to try and ensure that uh, the seafood and fishery resources that we're accessing as, a, as the United States are not impacting endangered species. And seeing as that there's only about 10 to 15 of the vaquita porpoise left, um, they're qualified underneath both the Endangered Species Act and the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Um, and specifically, there's concerns that shrimp fishers within the region are catching these vaquita within their gill nets, and therefore this encouraged both the Trump administration as well as the Biden administration to continue these bans. But furthermore, what we see in other parts of Mexico is much larger, more commercialized shrimp trawler fleets, um, and these do have pretty devastating impacts on ecosystems. Um, which led to this all-out ban to protect sea turtles. However, it's important to note that pengas or small boats within Mexico were also impacted by the ban, even though they weren't contributing to these environmental issues. Um, but turning specifically to the vaquita, there has been this controversy over the use of gill nets, which is a specific type of fishing instrument. Um, and both the Mexican government, the United States government, and environmental NGOs within the region uh, have proposed gear switching, so switching to modified types of nets that they believe will have a limited impact on this uh, small porpoise. Um, however, there's significant problems with that. First, uh, especially during the pandemic when these fishers are relying on um, getting value from their shrimp, 
these alternative methods of catching shrimp are far less effective. In fact, gill nets catch three times as much shrimp and therefore require significantly less work and labor for these fisheries to produce the same amount of product. But furthermore, while alternative gear doesn't uh, impact the vaquita as much, um, they do catch 2.7 times more bycatch, a lot of which is unusable, which means they're uh, imposing more disturbances on ecosystems. And furthermore, in the era of climate change, it's really important for us to understand fuel costs and fuel use. Um, and these alternative gears, especially with the drag that they cause, use 30% more fuel to harvest shrimp. And so the bottom line, what this means is that in the upper Gulf of, North, or upper Gulf of California, um, an additional $8.5 million in governmental support each year would be required to offset local fishers' loss in revenue from switching their gear over, and even more from not only the import bans that has significantly decreased the market for these fishers, but also at various points when the Mexican government has introduced flat bans on fishing in the entire region. And I think something that complicates this a little further um, is ethnographic data from one of my advisors here at the University of Arizona, Dr. Marcela Vasquez-Leon, that demonstrates that gill nets are likely not the problem. Um, not only is there a significant illegal fishing industry in this region for the Totuaba, but also the impoundment of the Colorado River uh, towards the end of the 20th century has changed significantly the dynamics of this ecosystem. And climate change obviously is changing the ecosystem as well. So by placing the conservation onus on these small scale fishers, what you've done is blame them entirely for an issue that is not really entirely their fault. And this has become an economic bludgeon against a community that was already at risk before the pandemic and has faced significantly more stressors during the pandemic. And when we look towards a quantification of what these embargoes have done to these communities, we see that a Brookings Institution analysis found that the embargo established in 2018 impacts nearly $50 million worth of fisheries in the upper Gulf Coast each and every year. And the blanket ban on all wild caught shrimp in Mexico affected over $260 million worth of fisheries in the country. And this is significantly impacting people's livelihoods in a time when we can't be doing that. Uh, not only does this impact 42,000 fishers' jobs directly, but over 400,000 of those indirect jobs that I mentioned earlier. And so this is a significant problem. And so therefore, really the conclusion of my talk today is that I think when we start to look at our conservation priorities, whether it be sea turtles, whether it be vaquita, or a number of other marine species, and we try and place ourselves within these broader animal and plant societies that human society is situated within, we have to understand that the only way that we can effectively do that is by building relationships with local communities, by understanding the local knowledge and expertise that local communities bring and that these small scale fishermen bring, but working to impose these conservation policies with cooperation and in concert with these communities. Otherwise, what we are doing is imperiling the livelihoods and health and quality of life of these already at risk populations for the purposes of protecting animal species that are being impacted by a number of other environmental stressors at the same time. And therefore, I really think that we need to use a more multi-species relational approach when it comes to not only looking at shrimp fishing and conservation in these areas, but conservation globally and as a concept in academics as a whole. And with that, these are my references. And uh, you know, if you have any questions or wanna look at the reference list longer, you can contact me here. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jake. A big applause for Jake, uh, too, for his very interesting uh, uh, presentation. So now we move on to our question and answers. If you have a question, you can raise your hand or post it on the chat, whatever is more comfortable for you. So go ahead. There's a first question from, from Yvette. Uh, Oh, that was awesome. It was just an awesome presentation. I agree. Any questions, guys? Uh, for Jake, for Karen, for Franny, or for Ch Chetty, any of our presenters? Well, while you think and write your questions, I do have a quest couple of questions here. One is for Chetty. Uh, Dr. Robinson. So, uh, Cherry, how do you see the future of, of the mobile slaughter uh, uh, facilities or units? Uh, you present a couple of restrictions 
um, and complications. Uh, how do you see the future and does the pandemic have to help grow those slaughter facilities or has been more problematic for them? You know, I think it, it has um, potential for both. The pandemic absolutely brought attention to the lack of um, local sources for us to find animal proteins, specifically in the Southwest. Um, Arizona has a similar problem as New Mexico and West Texas. So um, the mobile slaughter units, the implementation, um, it was the whole project was with the directive from the legislator to, you know, with hopes that it would solve some of our problems that those units would be able to pull up and harvest and cut and wrap in the meat and provide people with protein. That's not their function, but the reality is, is it gives processors additional capacity if they were to implement it um, to bring in animals that might technically be out of range of their normal operations and bring in animals. Right now, people are still, the kill dates for animals are still so far back up that um, that's probably not likely to happen. But once we get probably to a more stable state, the implementation of a mobile slaughter unit could potentially provide a lot of support for a, a processor that might have a large capacity and be strategically located where they don't, they can pull in more processor or more product, more animals. So I think it's, it's, it would be an added service to producers and not a solution for our animal meat pro protein issues. Perfect, Anna, uh, thank you. Uh, Cherry, and another question uh, to that. Do you see a potential like um, for local markets, will there be like an alternative or or you think economically it's not uh, feasible? Um, the, the interesting part about local markets is unfortunately the local tends to imply more expensive just because of the economies of scale and the ability to be efficient at a smaller level, right? When you're operating a smaller unit processing plant, you're only killing 10 head a day instead of 200 head a day with the same kind of labor cost. So it's, it's, it's a different scale. I do believe that there are producers or consumers that are interested and will search out local. They have the value for it and they're willing to pay a premium for it. Um, do we have a lot of those in New Mexico, in our rural communities? I don't know that. I can't answer that. But I do know that there are consumers that will source out local and buying. I mean, the reality is, is COVID made people buy freezers. Think about that. It was one of the top um, appliances that had not been purchased in 10 years and people were out. You couldn't buy a freezer. So now they have freezers. So maybe they'll go and move forward and buy instead of maybe not a half of beef because that's a, a large investment, but maybe box beef and do a subscription, an annual, sub, you know, a monthly subscription and get a local beef in parcels throughout the year. Those kind of options I think are very feasible and at least citizens in New Mexico have the incomes to support a, a regular purchase like that versus, you know, buying a half of beef right now is, you know, we're talking three grand. That's a lot of money, but they have the freezer space now. So we're, we're moving ahead. That's the good part. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, uh, do we, we do have a question from, uh, from David uh, for Jack, Jake. Uh, do you know if COVID impacted males disproportionately in these fisheries communities, given that they were the ones out working so it, since it is such a gender practice, gendered practice? If so, if so, what are the implication of this in Mexico's small fisheries? Are they under three, under street to change those gender practices? Yeah, so I guess this is a kind of a multi-part answer, but I guess the first thing is it's a little hard to quantify specifically um, the impact um, in, in terms of gender and even just in number of cases, given the lack of healthcare infrastructure in a lot of these rural communities. Um, so it's really hard to give you a like specific answer that way. 
Um, and especially since we do know that, you know, women are working in a number of other areas within the fisheries industry, um, especially indoor at processing plants, um, you know, still working with others to do some of these conservation surveilling practices um, and doing some more of the business operations. Um, so I think that both men and women were at significant risk of COVID, especially given the lack of healthcare access. Um, but I'd say that uh, female fishers tended to be more at risk given their uh, lesser access to healthcare resources. Um, but I think the implications for Mexico's small scale fisheries in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic is still just recovering some of this access to international markets, right? That um, with COVID changing a lot of the ways in which the fishing industry is being done and the supply chains and the access that way, um, that I think that that's still kind of the, the biggest long-term implication for these small scale fisheries. And as far as the stress for those gender practices to change, um, I mean, over the last few decades, especially after the reform of Article 27 uh, in the Mexican Constitution, we have seen increasing uh, female leadership within the Hidos. Um, and, you know, we have started to see some increasing female participation and leadership within uh, fishing collectives. And there are a number of government um, programs intended to encourage new female leadership within these small scale fisheries. Um, however, it is partially a matter of implementation. And again, if a lot of these collectives have uh, experience and expertise requirements um, of, you know, you have to have been fishing or, you know, within these kind of practices for so long in order to gain a full membership, it can be rather difficult uh, barrier for entry, so. Thank you very much. I believe there's another question. Thank you, David says, thank you. Any more questions for the panelists? I do have, I don't see another question, but I do have one for Frenny. Um, Freddy, so you talk, you presented statistic related uh, the importance of uh, milk import uh, from uh, the U.S. to Mexico being one of the um, strongest importer uh, uh, exporters from the U.S. Um, do you have any information? We've seen the trend in the U.S. that people now are drinking less um, cow milk and now drinking, and I know animal scientists don't like this word, word but alternative <laughs> milk, milk products or, or almond milk, or how should I call it? <laughs> but do you see this trend happening in Mexico and which consequences would it have to the dairy production in the States? So it's interesting, um, I don't see it as a, an immediate issue. Um, it's interesting from some of our students, there is a focus on shifting away from when we, our Mexico students are very similar to our US students and their interest in some of these um, new technology type of foods and the, the sort of awareness of kind of ethics and all those issues that they're grappling with. Um, in my mind, it's not, a, it's not going to be as widely adopted right away because of the issue of um, you're still, they're, they're more drought constrained in their major growing areas than even we are. And so they don't, the cost of it is just really prohibitive. I don't mean that there's not some increase in consumption, but um, I don't think it will be as widely adopted in Mexico in the, in the near term. Okay, thank you. And, and did, uh, did they see any supply chain disruption like from going, did the USA market there was affected because of uh, supply chain re, uh, disruption during the COVID? Yeah, they had a lot of the same issue with fluid milk consumption dropping as they um, have the same like milk consumption as at schools is a big distribution point. And so as they went online, that's one of the reasons that you saw the drop in 2020 for fluid milk consumption, is that more people were at home and you saw that drop in the kind of uh, commercial distribution of milk. But it did push the increase in the ultra high treated, ultra high temperature products because of the shelf stability and the fact that it would last longer. Um, so it did kind of increase the demand for that. That's one of the sort of shifts. Um, I don't know on the sort of the supply jams that we had. Um, I think one of the things is that they have, while they don't have the same scale and the economies of scale, 
their milk production, especially further south, has a little bit more of the resilience built into it because of those small scale producers and the local distribution. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Franny. Any more questions? I do have one for Karen related to uh, foodborne outbreaks. And uh, with my food science background, uh, there's a lot of information. I, uh, I really appreciate your presentation, Karen. So uh, you did show us that during the pandemic, uh, we had a strong decrease on foodborne um, and pathogens and problems. Is there something we should learn from this pandemic? Because uh, the ones that you show were person to person. So I understand that shows the strength of the um, food safety regulations in the food industry. And correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, what would be the takeaways from this pandemic for the food safety aspects based on your experience? in this two last year's experience. Yeah, and it wasn't just here in New Mexico that we saw a real decrease, especially in norovirus, which is very much person to person. Um, it can be transmitted through food as well, but most of the norovirus uh, outbreaks are person to person. And that we have not got back up to our pre-pandemic levels nationwide. So um, I guess the lesson is the germs were super not happy while we were all home. That didn't matter which one it was, but we are coming back up to where we had been before the pandemic, Our, especially other states, because we came out of lockdown so much later than other states, they were seeing it before we did. So, you know, it goes back to the, the very basic public health measures, wash your hands, you know, stay home when you're sick and, um, and, all these germs are going to find a way to find us. I mean, COVID is a really good example. It's here comes our next wave and it's going to find the, the few that slipped through the cracks before, I think. I'm really hoping it doesn't get as high as our last surge, but, but we'll see. So um, I think that basically a lot of these pathogens are going to continue to be spread person to person. Um, I think there are a lot of people that now have a lot of public health measures incorporated into what they do on a personal level, which will help. Um, like I said, we're not seeing the levels of norovirus outbreaks nationwide that we had seen before the pandemic. So um, I think our food safety uh, institutions are doing a really good job and they have been. I, it's not, it's uh, very unusual to have large foodborne outbreaks anymore um, that aren't caught fairly quickly. And uh, even like I said, finding FDA, finding that the onions were the ones that were coming in from Mexico. I think they can do that pretty quickly, especially with all genome sequencing now. So that's how we're gonna find most of our clusters. Um, and it's gonna be much less ha having a restaurant outbreak going on. It's gonna be the whole genome sequencing going on across the country and linking those isolates together is how we're gonna be doing outbreak investigations in the future, I think. Thank you very much, Karen. Anyone else, any more questions? I don't see any in the uh, chat. So we still have one minute. Use this opportunity. One, two, three, okay. You miss your opportunity, but if not, you can contact the experts at any time. Uh, we, um, on, on behalf of the organizing committee, I wanna thank the panelists, Chetty, Franny, uh, um, Karen and Jake for, uh, willing to present at this uh, symposium and uh, we really appreciate a lot of uh, all of your work and your um, that you're doing and um, so a big applause for everyone um, thank you for organizing this and putting it all together I really appreciate it and, and for attending. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much and then just remind you we have two more panels one at 245 related to public health and then at 4.15, we have another food assistance panel. So please uh, come and join us uh, to hear the specialists and discuss uh, their positions. Have a, a great day and see you in other panels. Bye. The COVID-19 uh, impact 
could be estimated in economic terms and provide some uh, background on a technique that has been widely used called input output approach. And in particular, also present some uh, software that can be used in order to estimate uh, this uh, COVID-19 disruption in terms of uh, jobs lost, uh, as well as income, personal income lost by industry in a local economy in general, and in particular to set up pretty much some guidelines of how can this technique can be, uh, how can this technique be used to estimate the economic impact in the US, uh, Mexico border region, in particular in the counties uh, in, uh, along the, the, the border. Could you please uh, go to the next slide? Please? Thank you. So here's a brief outline. Uh, again, like uh, my presentation uh, is pretty much, um, mm, I, I'm gonna talk about this research that it is ongoing. And in particular, as Yvette mentioned, um, a co-author and I have recently uh, worked on trying to estimate the economic impact of the air passenger industry in um, Austin. And now we are exploring um, just like, or trying to replicate that methodology to uh, try to understand the economic impact in uh, the, the border counties. And this presentation is pretty much an introduction to the ongoing process that we have uh, right now. So, uh, given this background or in context, uh, I will first uh, introduce the objectives of this presentation. Then I will provide uh, the context of, uh, from an economic uh, view, how local food systems can be approached from the food supply chain perspective. And this will give us some opportunity to try to describe the uh, impact methodology that can be applied to uh, try to estimate the uh, COVID-19 impact in different aspects, such as economic aspects, environmental aspects, and social aspects. Then I will provide uh, economic impact analysis, which we will be using to estimate the uh, economic impact of uh, COVID-19 in uh, local food systems. And lastly, I will uh, just present some ideas of softwares that can be used in order to estimate this type of, of analysis. Can you move to the other uh, slide? Thank you. So uh, the objective of this presentation consists of uh, um, present some available regional modeling techniques that can be used to estimate uh, the impacts of COVID-19 on local food systems. And also the objective of this presentation is to present input output as a methodology to estimate economic impact of COVID-19 and also uh, setting up the guidelines of how can we uh, apply input output uh, methodology to estimate the economic impact uh, in the counties located at the US-Mexico border region. Next slide, please. Thank you. So pretty much, uh, uh, we did a lead review of how other uh, researchers in economics have approached uh, the COVID-19 impact on food systems and uh, we found in some, some academic papers that uh, the term local food systems and food supply chain are used uh, interchangeably. And in particular, I wanted to present this, uh, this slide to uh, pretty much uh, visualize what the uh, local uh, food system look like 
uh, of the fruit, to, uh, fruit supply chain. And this in economic terms could uh, pretty much be related to each other. So first, uh, the local food system uh, could be seen as the process of uh, pretty much uh, growing food to harvesting food, distributing food, uh, selling food in, in the supermarkets and eventually uh, food consuming by, by the consumers. And uh, lastly, uh, food uh, getting disposed. This uh, for the uh, local food system and uh, food supply chain. Uh, it, it mirrors pretty much the process. So, uh, it comes first, uh, the raw materials uh, into play, and then uh, these raw materials are uh, produced and manufactured. Eventually they are packaged and transported for the market and retail. And uh, lastly, uh, is um, consumed by, by consumers. And pretty much I provided the uh side by side uh graph system with a food supply chain can you uh go to the next slide please thank you so uh i just wanted to provide some insight to uh what methodology we could potentially apply to try to estimate uh covid19 impacts in um in local economies and I could uh, think of three, three types of, of studies or analysis to focus on uh, different aspects. And uh, the, the first one that, uh, and which is gonna be the one that we will be presenting, it's the economic impact analysis. And uh, with this methodology, we could focus on understanding um, the COVID-19 impact in, in monetary terms and uh, not only on um, direct effects or direct uh, disruption, but also uh, pretty much understanding uh, given the, the industries that are involved in the food supply chain, how COVID-19 impacted each of these uh, industries and these are called uh, an indirect effects. I will elaborate a little bit more on the next uh, few slides. And also uh, this type of methodology allows to understand the effects uh, in terms of induced effects. So I will also elaborate a little bit more on the, on the further slides, but this type of induced effect refers to the economic impact in terms of um, how local consumers uh, uh, mm, pretty much uh, affect or get affected by uh, e economic events outside uh, of, of the uh, local economy. So pretty much uh, this uh, induced effect will capture the effect of the retail stores or the gas stations. Again, I will elaborate a little bit more on the next slide. So, Another uh, impact methodology that could be applied is the environmental life cycle analysis. And for this type of analysis, uh, the main objective is to capture environmental impacts. And I included right here a diagram uh, applied to uh, food systems. And pretty much this type of studies um, focuses on energy and material input at every stage of uh, the system and also focuses on the emissions to air, water, and soil um, in each of the, of the stages. So for instance, in this diagram, uh, we could observe that uh, the uh, agricultural production uh, needs uh, some energy or in, in material input and um, it generates some, some emissions. And, the same for transportation, that's same for uh, cogeneration and, and final conversion. 
So the environmental life cycle analysis focuses on uh, a trade-off between production and environmental uh, effects. And thirdly, we have this social cost benefit analysis approach, which encompasses uh, the economic impact analysis, the environmental life cycle assessment in some cases, and also the social uh, impact that, uh, for instance, COVID-19 um, could have in a local economy. And uh, again, we will focus on this presentation on uh, trying to explain how can we use economic impact analysis to estimate the impact of COVID-19 in a local economy. Can you please go to the next slide? Thank you. So uh, economic impact analysis is based on a technique called input-output or has some background in, in linear algebra. So pretty much this, uh, this technique combines or uh, is helpful to understand the interconnectivity between industries in a local economy by understanding uh, the financial, financial linkages between industries. So for instance, uh, input output technique allows to um, understand um, what's behind a final product in terms of, of input. And in particular, uh, in, in the food market, uh, this type of analysis is helpful or this type of technique is helpful to understand uh, what industries intervene in food production since uh, like every stage in its production process. So for instance, this type of analysis will uh, give you an idea of how uh, agricultural jobs are related to um, transportation jobs, to um, um, food processing jobs, and also to um, retail market jobs. And this type of technique allows to uh, understand how dollars flow in each of these uh, stages of the economy in the production process in a very detailed way by, by industry. So uh, input output technique consists of two simple ideas, the interdependency of industries, uh, and also the distinction between uh, intermediate and final demand. So at the end of the day, uh, the products that, that we see in the supermarket has a lot of stages uh, behind and uh, input output technique help us visualizing each of these stages in the production uh, mm, stages. So can we go to the next slide? Impact study uses input output technique. And uh, these type of studies measure the net changes in new economic activities associated with an industry, event, or policy in a regional economy. So these type of studies are helpful to understand either uh, positive impact in the local economy, such as a firm establishing in, in the local economy and understanding how each of uh, these um, production flows affect in the local economy, or uh, this could also be used to understand the economic impact of um, a disruption, a negative disruption in the economy, such as COVID-19 uh, impact in, in terms of uh, monetary losses. And this technique will be helpful to understand the uh, losses by, by industry in every stage of, of the production process in a local economy. So usually an economic impact study consists of uh, four uh, variables. Uh, the first one is employment. The second one is labor income. The third one is value added. And lastly, the fourth one is output, which also can be considered as sales. And this type of analysis uh, 
helps you understand how um, a, 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 an original uh, disruption in the account variables. Uh, both in, um, in terms of direct effect, indirect effect, induced effects, as well as uh, by industry. So pretty much uh, the direct effect uh, consists of the effects, uh, the, the original impact on a particular sector. Um, so for instance, in the air passenger uh, case, uh, how we approach the COVID-19 impact was uh, by trying to understand the, the number of flights uh, that were uh, impacted because of COVID-19 um, restrictions between 2020 to 2019. And um, also converting those, uh, those flight uh, losses in monetary terms. So that would be the direct impact. The direct impact in this case would be uh, the monetary losses because of the COVID-19 restriction in the air passenger industry. The indirect effect help us to understand how those industries that uh, were connected to the air passenger industry uh, were affected by COVID-19. So for instance, this direct uh, effect uh, could, could relate to the, uh, oh, the, mm, those industries that um, are, are in charge of cleaning up the, the airplanes, uh, also the, those industries that are related to make repairs to, to the airplanes, also hotels and accommodation, and also some other uh, food related industries that are connected to the air passenger industry. Lastly, the induced effect consists of uh, those monetary losses that uh, the local economy, uh, I am just like uh, received because of the losses of the direct and indirect effects. So in particular, induced effect refers to the local spending uh, of, of uh, the local population in terms of uh, Mm, just like spending in, in uh, gas stations or grocery stores. So whenever this type of, of effect of direct and indirect effect occur, uh, people have less uh, available income locally and they can consume less in the local economy. Therefore, uh, the um, consumers or, or the, the grocery stores and the gas stations, for example, get affected by the direct and indirect effect. And those effects are measured uh, in the induced effect in this type of analysis. So the economic impact study helps to measure the, or split the uh, economic impact in direct terms, indirect terms, and induced uh, effects for every $1 lost in the economy. Can we go to the next slide? So pretty much uh, there are some software that can be used to estimate uh, this type of analysis. Uh, generally, there are uh, around five, five different software. Uh, one of them is called INPLAN, and it stands for Economic Impact Analysis for Planning. And uh, this software allows to um, split the effect, the direct effect of uh, let's say the COVID-19 impact or an induced effect. And the software uh, could be used to understand these effects by industry. And also um, pretty much in a nutshell, this type of uh, software is a modeling, uh, regional modeling technique that um, has an input output model embedded, and also it combines additional modeling techniques, such as econometric model and location quotients to uh, try to understand this type of effect and split them. Can we go to the next slide? 
So pretty much Inplan is just one of the softwares that can be used. There's also other alternatives such as RIMS2 multipliers or um, um, REMI. That's another software that can be used to try to estimate the economic impact of, of uh, the, in this case of the pandemic in food systems. And um, one um, application of, of implant and in particular of economic impact analysis to measure the, the COVID-19 effects in the um, food supply chain could be um, approached by first identifying each of the uh, counties in uh, across the US Mexico border a region as, as I showed here in the in the in the map and also uh, we could focus on a particular uh, sector of the economy to try to understand what the direct effects were because of uh, COVID-19 in that particular sector. So for instance, uh, we can use the um, food packaging and processing or the food, uh, mm, food harvesting. Uh, in particular, um, because of COVID-19 pandemic, some uh, fertilizers were uh, limited and that, that limitation in fertilizers could be translated in economic terms and measured as direct effect. And the, the, this type of analysis, the economic impact and uh, fertilizers uh, impact could be translated into monetary losses in each of these stages of the food supply chain. And uh, an advantage of using implant to estimate this type of project is that it helps you uh, consider more than one county. So for instance, implant could be uh, helpful to try to understand the impact of in, the, in the whole uh, US-Mexico border region by county. And it could be helpful also to estimate the direct, indirect, and induced effects of COVID-19 in food, food supply chain. Can we go to the next slide? So pretty much uh, wrapping up, implant can be used to estimate the economic impact of COVID-19 on local food systems or supply chain in the U.S. counties located along the, the uh, U.S.-Mexico border region. And this can help us to understand uh, the the economic impact in direct terms, in direct terms and induced terms. And also another advantage of this type of, of analysis is that it can give you some insight on multipliers. And this concept of multiplier pretty much tells you uh, for every loss, for every dollar loss in, in one particular industry, um, how much additional uh, impact can uh, your economy can, can receive. So for instance, in the fertilizer case, for every dollar uh, loss in the uh, fertilizer industry, uh, how, how much additional loss the, um, the local economy of uh, in particular in, in all the sectors related to the, the fertilizer industry could, could be affected. And this type of analysis is also helpful to understand not only the monetary effects, but also the effects in terms of job loss and also uh, value added. Very much, uh, can you go to the next slide? So pretty much uh, this was the, the presentation. Mm -hmm.